Uh, joy and privilege to be with you today, and I, I can't wait to see what God's going to do. You know, the disciples did not say, Lord, teach us to lead. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to preach. Didn't even say, Lord, teach us to start 501c3 nonprofits. <laughs> what, what did they ask you? They said, Lord, teach us to pray. You know why? Because when you change the way you pray, everything changes. And I'm just a guy that believes we're one prayer away from a totally different life. I believe in the power of prayer. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the few moments that we have together. I, I might talk fast because I feel like I have a lot to say. Now, Joel said I can talk as long as I want to, but you're all leaving at one. <clears throat> so I'm going to get in as much as I can. Now, I love sharing our story because our stories are not our stories, are, are they? We, we don't own them. It's his story, history with a little hyphen in there. Uh, it's his story that he's telling through our lives. And so before I speak today, let me take five minutes. And uh, I want to show you where the Lord has called uh, our family to Washington, D.C., right on Capitol Hill. And you'll get a glimpse of kind of the genesis of our story and a prayer circle, a prayer walk that I did 15 years ago. We're going to show it to you, and then I'll come right back, and we'll see what the Lord does. Fifteen years ago, National Community Church was meeting in a D.C. public school on Capitol Hill. There was nothing easy about our first year. Total church income was $2,000 a month, and it cost $1,600 just to rent the school. On a good Sunday, we'd start with eight or ten or twelve people. That's when I learned to close my eyes and worship, because it was too depressing to open them. To be honest, I didn't really feel like a pastor. The church didn't really feel like a church. I felt underqualified and overwhelmed, but that's when God has you right where He wants you. Why? Because it forces you to pray like it depends on God. It forces you to your knees. It forces you to live in raw dependence upon God. And raw dependence is the raw material out of which God performs His greatest miracles. Well, one day as I was dreaming about the church that God wanted to establish here on Capitol Hill, I felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to do a prayer walk. I was reading through the book of Joshua, and one of the promises jumped off the page and into my spirit. It says, I will give you everywhere you set your foot, just as I promised Moses. Well, as I read that promise given to Joshua, I felt like God wanted me to stake claim to the land he had called us to and pray a perimeter all the way around Capitol Hill. Part of me didn't want to do it because it was a hot and humid August morning, but I had this holy confidence that just as that promise had been transferred from Moses to Joshua, that God would transfer that promise to me if I had enough faith to circle it. And so I drew what would be my first prayer circle, and it still ranks as the longest prayer walk I've ever done. Starting at the front door of our row house on Capitol Hill, I walked east on F Street and turned south on 8th Street. I crossed East Capitol and Pennsylvania Avenue. I walked all the way to the Navy Yard and turned west on M Street. and then north on South Capitol Street. I paused to pray on the west steps of the Capitol that faced the National Mall, and then I completed the 4.7 mile prayer circle by walking around Union Station and heading home. It's hard to describe what I felt when I finished praying that circle. My feet were sore, but my spirit soared. 
I felt that same kind of holy confidence the Israelites must have felt when they crossed the Jordan River on dry ground and finally stepped into the Promised Land for the first time. It took about three hours to complete that prayer circle, but God's been answering that prayer for the last 15 years. Since that August day that I drew that prayer circle around Capitol Hill, National Community Church has grown from a core group of 19 people into one church with seven locations around the metro D.C. area. And God's given us the privilege of influencing tens of thousands of people over those 15 years. But it all started with a prayer circle. I believe that every blessing, every breakthrough, every miracle, every dream has a genealogy. And if you trace it all the way back to its origin, you'll find a prayer circle. Those blessings and breakthroughs and miracles and dreams are the byproduct of prayers that were prayed by you or for you. During my prayer walk around the hill, I drew circles around things I didn't even know how to ask for. Without even knowing it, I walked right by a crack house that would become Ebenezer's Coffee House, which we now own and operate. I walked under the marquee of an old movie theater on Barracks Row that's now our seventh campus, and I prayed around an $8 million piece of property that we now own debt-free where we'll build a future campus. If I had not drawn those prayer circles, I don't think we would own those properties. You see, God has determined that certain expressions of His power will only be exercised in response to prayer. Simply put, we have not because we ask not. Or maybe I should say, we have not because we circle not. The greatest tragedy in life are the prayers that go unanswered because they go unasked. But if you have the courage to circle the promise, circle the dream, circle the miracle, you never know how or when or where God might answer that prayer. Well, if you have a Bible, turn over to Acts chapter 10, and I want to let you know that we have a copy of the Circle Maker. It's a gift for you, and so I think on the way out, we should have copies for everybody. And... Uh, Merry Christmas. <laughs> we'll get to Acts chapter 10 in just a moment. I better explain where the title comes from. I was reading through the Talmud, this collection of Jewish legends and stories and commentary on the Old Testament, a number of years ago when I discovered a true legend about Honi the circle maker. In the first century BC, there was a drought in Israel threatened to destroy a generation, and there was one man who was famous for praying for rain, almost like Elijah. Uh, he just had faith for it, and the people asked him to pray, and, and here's what he did. He took a staff, and he began to turn, and, and turn, and turn, until he literally stood inside this circle that he had drawn. And, and then he got down on his knees, and he prayed this prayer. He said, Sovereign Lord, I swear before your great name that I will not leave this circle until you have mercy upon your children. That's a bold prayer. God doesn't answer that prayer. You're going to look pretty foolish. You might be in that circle a long time. It begins to rain. People rejoice, but not honey. He's still on his knees. He says, not for such rain have I prayed but for the rain that will fill pits and caverns and cisterns. Now, according to the historical record, it starts raining so hard that they have to actually go up to the Temple Mount because of flash floods. Now, Honey's still in his circle. He says, not for such rain have I prayed, but for the rain of your favor, blessing, and graciousness. And it starts to rain in perfect moderation. Now, you ready for this? The Sanhedrin almost excommunicated him because they said, you can't, you can't put God in a corner or, or circle him in that way, and, and but you can't argue with a miracle either, can you? 
And so ultimately, he was honored for a prayer that saved a generation. Are you hearing me? The power of a prayer to save a generation? A generation owed their lives to one man who had the faith to pray a bold prayer. I want to talk about prayer genealogies for just a moment. We all have a family genealogy. You know what I'm talking about. I, I come from some Battersons, my, my, my name, but also some Johansons. I got some Swedish blood running through my veins. We all have a genealogy, but I think we all have a prayer genealogy. Now, I can't think of a more appropriate place. It's just dawning on me as I'm standing here in a place that, that believes in the power of Prayer, I can't imagine a more appropriate setting to preach this message. As we look at 68,000 prayer requests, and, and you may never meet the people that you're praying for on this side of the space-time continuum, but when we get to the other side, oh man, some people are going to know, some people they didn't know were praying for them. Can I, can I just say this? I think one of the greatest moments um, in eternity is going to be this moment when God peels back the curtain and says, look at this, I'm going to connect the dots between the blessings and miracles and breakthroughs in your lives and the prayers that were prayed for you. And it's going to be this web that, that God, and we're going to stand back and say, surely the Lord does order the footsteps of the righteous. But surely the Lord does go before us and fight our battles for us. Um, what a moment that is going to be. Okay, Acts 10. I'm so excited about this. I, I think you're going to see this passage in a way that maybe you've never noticed before. I want to show you what happens when two people pray. What happens when two people pray? We're about to find out. Acts chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea... There was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need. Oh, I wish I had time to talk about that. Listen, generosity, it postures you for God to move in miraculous ways. It just... It just sets things up, and then you get to see God move. And it says he gave generously, and here it is. If you underline in your Bible, underline this. He prayed to God regularly. So what that tells me about Cornelius is he has a prayer habit. Now, I don't know if it was three times a day. I don't know if he knelt. I don't know if he did prayer walks. But he prayed regularly. Okay, if you're taking notes, jot this down, because here's a thought. In my experience... When you pray regularly, irregular things will happen regularly. <laughs> when I pray, coincidences happen. And when I don't, they don't. And I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in providences. And when you pray regularly, guess what? What happens next can happen in your life. I love these two words. Let these next two words get in your spirit. Because when you pray regularly, here it is, one day. Because today could be the day. Today could be the day. And this is exactly what happens. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. I mean, this is incredible. But, but it's because he was praying regularly. One of the joys of writing The Circle Maker is, is every day I get letters and emails from people who are praying. And, and it's so fun because people are, they're, I've got doctors who said, hey, I, you know, I do rounds, but now it's like prayer circles and, and uh, teachers who are circling their classroom. I had one guy who was praying for a financial miracle, and he said, I, start, I just decided I'm going to go over and circle the bank. <laughs> Careful. Careful. <laughs> he, he, uh, he got stopped, um, and uh, they were wondering what was going on. Okay, I'm going to share something with you because, you, you, I mean, we know that the news coming out of Washington is political. 
But there is a wonderful spiritual undercurrent that's getting stronger and deeper and faster. God is moving in profound ways. And that's just my observation from living there, ministering there for 16 years. And might be evidenced by what happened um, just, just a week ago. Uh, a, a United States congressman came over and said, I wanted to have coffee with you. Now, this doesn't happen to me every day. I thought, this is curious. And he sat down and he began to share his story with me. He, he said that uh, in 2007, uh, the Holy Spirit just said to him, get ready. Now, I don't know, it sounds a lot like this kind of scenario, that if you pray right, he was directing the largest Christian camp in the country, but the Holy Spirit said, get ready. For several months, the Holy Spirit kind of kept saying the same thing, get ready, get ready. And he's like, get ready for what? Don't you love it when God does that? Like, can we have a little bit more information to go on? And then one day, he's, he's flipping through the newspaper, and he reads that the congresswoman who represents his district is thinking about a run for governor. And the Lord says, this is it. And, and he's like, he didn't have a political bone in his body. He didn't even know the boundaries of his congressional district. He had to go online and he had to find out, like the, the look it all up. And, and his wife comes in and says, what, what are you doing? He said, I'm looking up county statistics. And she says, we're running for Congress, aren't we? They had never talked about it. The thought had never crossed their minds. And the Holy Spirit, in the same moment, birthed it. Now, here's the catch. There's no way this guy's going to win. No network, no money, no, like, no way. No way. Until a few months before the election when the front runner drops out of the race. The next thing you know, he's elected to Congress. He's serving his second term. Now, here's why he came over to talk to me, and it, it blessed me, because um, during that time, he'd gotten a hold of uh, a book I'd written called Wild Goose Chase. Um, Celtic Christians called the Holy Spirit the wild goose. Don't you love that? <laughs> Doesn't it feel like a wild goose chase? He said, a friend said you have to read it. He said, I thought I was losing my mind and crazy, and somehow reading that book just, all right, maybe I am crazy, but so is the Holy Spirit. Um, and so he, uh, he just felt like, and, and he said, and now I'm reading the circle maker. And here's what he told me. He said, every morning I circle the fifth floor of my congressional office building, praying for this country, praying for my constituents, praying for my fellow members of Congress. Praise God. Praise God. You just never know when the one day is. But it could be today. I'm, I just live with the holy anticipation that God could show up at any moment and change everything. It's just this holy anticipation. What is God going to do next? Oh, is it in your spirit? Are you feeling it? One guy praying. Not even to the second guy praying yet. All right, let's keep going. Verse 4. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. I'm just going to pause right here. I want to say something. I, I, I had a grandfather uh, that prayed for his grandchildren. In fact, he used to kneel down every night before bed and and he would pray for his family. Now, he was hard of hearing, and he would take off his hearing aid, and he couldn't hear himself, but everybody else in the house could. <laughs> and it's a powerful thing when you hear a grandfather calling out your name and, and interceding for you. Now, he died when I was six years old, okay? But his prayers did not die. Our prayers never die. They're never forgotten. I just love this idea of a memorial offering before God. I want to tell you that some of the most powerful moments in my life have been the moments that the Holy Spirit has said, Mark, the prayers of your grandfather are being answered in your life right now. And I get goosebumps. I'm like, oh God, you are so sovereign and so faithful. 
Your prayers are not forgotten. Listen, they are a memorial offering before God. Now, here's where the story gets crazy. It says, now, send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and said, I think I've lost my mind. Is that what your version says? <laughs> see, we just read this and assume. Of course he's going to send his men to job. But see, I'm the guy that says, wait, you want me to go where? To meet who, who is also called what? And is staying with whom? <laughs> like, this, this, is, this is what I would call a prayer prompting. And, and I think too often we, we pray and just think that then we're, we're done. I think one of the great purposes of prayer, and by the way, it's not about, some people feel like, oh, I, I, don't, I can't pray because I don't have it all figured out what I'm going to ask God for. Oh, really? So you, what you're saying is you don't have your agenda for God all spelled out so that you can tell him your agenda. That's not the purpose of the prayer. The purpose of prayer is to get in the presence of God and get God's agenda for you. Um, say, well, what's the big deal? Joppa, Caesarea. Well, here's the big deal. Um, they're 32 miles apart. Well, that seems like you're defeating your purpose here like that. In the first century, the average person never traveled outside a 30-mile radius of their birthplace. Do you understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying is that God basically told Cornelius... Here's what I want you to do. I want you to step outside the only universe you've ever known. I want you to go somewhere you've never been, meet someone you've never met. This is crazy. It's crazy. Now, I love telling stories because I believe that, that we, we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. I am a testimony connoisseur. And I love sharing my testimony, because if I don't share it, you don't know how God's moving in my life. And if I don't hear your story, then I don't know what God's doing, and I might be tempted to think he's not doing anything. <laughs> but he is. I'm going to give you the abbreviated version. We own and operate a coffee house on Capitol Hill called Ebenezer's, and you know, it kind of comes out of this idea that there are ways of doing church that no one's thought of yet. Instead of building a church building, we thought, let's just build a coffee house, it's a postmodern well. Jesus hung out at wells, a place where church and community can cross paths. And then every penny of profit we give to missions. Um, last year, net was, I think, $140,000. And every penny of that is going to different ministries around the world that we're involved with. And so God's blessed it. Um, we love it. But here's the backstory. We wouldn't have been able to get that crack house and get it rezoned and kind of, and by the way, we circled it in prayer for five years and four people offered more money for it than we did, two of them real estate developers. I, I don't know, I'm not a realtor, but I found that the more I pray, it seems like the more prices go down. <laughs> and, uh, and my only explanation is Matthew 18, 18, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Listen, our prayers are the way that we place binding contracts on things. Now, I want to be careful here. Two-fold litmus test, will of God, glory of God. It's got to be in the will of God. It's got to be for the glory of God. But you begin to pray in the will of God for the glory of God, and you don't even begin to understand the authority that's yours in Christ to bind things in prayer. And we bound it and said, God, it belongs to you. This is where lives are going to be touched and changed. You're going to be glorified in this place. And so God gave it to us. But we have this row house right next to it, which was the first property that we purchased. Now, again, 15 years ago, did a prayer circle around all of these. Here's what we did. When we bought that row house, we began laying hands on the crack house and said, God, give us that crack house so we can turn it into a coffee house. But the story goes back further than that. How do we get the row house? I'll tell you how, through two bitter disappointments. Because it was 1997, church office was a spare bedroom in our house, and then my second, Summer, was born. And so we'd set up her porta crib at night, and it was her bedroom at night, and then unplug the church phone. And then in the morning, I'd fold up the porta crib and plug in the phone. It was my church office. The commute was great. 
But it got real old. Like, I mean, this is getting old. So we started looking for office space. And there were two row houses within two blocks of this area where, that we bid on. And I, I, I'm telling you, I said, Lord, they're perfect. And each time, the morning that we went in to place the contract offer, a contract was placed the night before. And I remember just thinking, God, did you hear me? Like, what, what is going on? Well, it was in the middle of that disappointment that one day I'm walking home from Union Station. And, and, and I'm walking in front of 205 F Street Northeast. And as I, and as I walk in front of this warehouse, there's no for sale sign. There's nothing indicating that it's for sale, but I just feel this prompting. And it's like the Lord gives me this name, Robert Thomas. Now, I'd met the owner a year before. I'm not great with names, but I was pretty sure what the Lord was giving me was his name and that I needed to call him. I'm thinking, Lord, but what am I going to say? Like, hey, this is Mark Batterson. About all I got. <laughs> but I decided it's crazy enough. I'm going to go home, and now this is pre-Google, so I'm looking through the white pages, and I find eight Robert Thomases, and it's like eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And I, and I just kind of pick one, and I pick up the telephone call and say, uh, hi, is this Robert Thomas? Yes, and hey, this is Mark Batterson. I don't know if you would remember me. We met about a year ago, and he interrupts me, and he says, I was just thinking about you. I was thinking about selling my, my row home, and before I put it on the market, I wondered if you might be interested in it, but I wasn't sure how to get a hold of you. Okay. Now, can I just make a side observation here? Sometimes God shows up, and sometimes God shows off. <laughs> and I love it when God shows off. It was one of those moments. that, And, and so we bought it. It, it just appraised for $900,000. We just, we just, um, but we bought it for $225,000. It gave us a footprint. Then we bought the, the crack house next to it. And then our journey continued. But, but here's the deal. It was this crazy prayer prompting. See, I just don't want to live my life, get to the end of my life, and wonder what if. Man, I want to obey those promptings. And, and wow, I mean, you got to get into the presence of God. You have to press in, and you have to be so close to the Lord that you can hear the still, small voice. But if you live in that intimate place with God, you're going to hear that voice. And sometimes it's tough. Is that, is that my own voice? Is that God's voice? Listen, I know it's hard. But if you obey those promptings, you might just set up a miracle. Okay, so here's where we are right now. One guy praying. What happens when there are two people praying? I'm going to move even quicker. Here we go. Peter in verse number 9. About noon the following day as they were on their journey approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry, wanted something to eat. While the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open, something like a large sheep being let down, contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now, this made no sense, and I'll tell you why. Because according to Jewish dietary laws, these are unclean animals. Peter would never think about it. It was unthinkable. And so let's let's cut Peter a little bit of slack, but you also have to give a little chuckle here to what he says. Surely not, Lord. <laughs> now, technically, I don't think if he's Lord, you're allowed to say no. <laughs> technically speaking. Um, but it didn't make any sense. Um, you know, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. Here's just a little teaching point here, because I've had moments where the Lord has asked me to do something. I, I remember... Our first year when our income was $2,000 a month, and the Lord prompted me and said, it's time to start giving to missions. Now, I thought the Lord either misspoke or I misheard, because we're the missionaries. <laughs> I think what you, you want to be prompting someone else, Lord, and point them our direction. <laughs> and I'm thinking, like, this isn't even good stewardship, Lord. We aren't even self-supporting. And, and, but it was, so, it was so distinct. Mark, you step out in faith, and you start giving to missions. I remember writing that first $50 check. You had to pry it out of my fingers. <laughs> this last year, I mean, we're a church of 20-somethings. 
We gave a million three hundred eighty-four thousand dollars to missions, and we're just getting started. Listen, our heartbeat is missions, but it began with a moment that we took a step of faith. Here, here's the teaching point. Have you ever gotten into an argument with God? If you win that argument, you lose. And if you lose that argument, you win. See, I lost that argument. I said, by faith, we're going to do it. And you know what? Once again, God delivered on his promises. Luke 6, 38, given, it'll be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, be poured into your lap. With the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. The voice spoke to him a second time. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. Verse 16. This happened three times. I don't know what it is about Peter and the number three. <laughs> Immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, men from Cornelius found out where Simon's house was, stopped at the gate. And here's where you see the divine appointment happening. Listen, in my experience, prayer turns appointments into divine appointments. By the way, Prayer is the difference between you fighting for God and God fighting for you. Amen. Oh, and by the way, prayer is the difference between the best you can do and the best God can do. Amen. See, I just think when you hit your knees, God extends his right hand, and then we step back in awe and say, wow, my fingerprints are nowhere to be found. This is the fingerprint of God. Amen. That's what's happening here. You can see the footsteps being ordered. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up, go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I sent them. And it gets crazier. Now we go from eating unclean food to associating with someone who's unclean. This was unthinkable. At this point, th this is a sect of Judaism. Well, what about the day of Pentecost? Those were Jewish pilgrims. This was unthinkable to go into the home of someone who was a Gentile. And yet God says, I want you to go. Listen, can I tell you something? Peter had to risk his reputation to do this, didn't he? But if you aren't willing to risk your reputation, you will never establish God's reputation. There are going to be moments in your life where you've got to lay it on the line and say, I'm going to look foolish, but I'm going to do it. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along the following day, verse 24, he arrived at Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, called together his relatives and his close friends. We're going to end with this. Here it is, verse 25, a little phrase. As Peter entered the house. Why would you end with that? That seems a little anticlimactic. I've entered lots of houses. You basically step through it. If there's a door, you knock or open the doorknob. And why, you know, what's the big deal about Peter entering this house? Well, this is a threshold. It's a portal. This is unthinkable. This is unbelievable. In this moment, it's like Peter says, this is the craziest thing I've ever done. Now, we know what happens, right? Cornelius, his entire household is saved. They're baptized. But, but here's where our prayer genealogy comes into focus. Here's what I want you to see. Just closing thought, and then we're done. The moment that Peter entered the house, are you ready for this? Here we go. Whosoever will may come. In that moment, the gospel is open up to everybody. This thing that was just the sect of Judaism, every language and nation and tribe, everyone. Jesus died for everyone. But it took this step of faith. What led to that step of faith? Two people praying. Why are you here today? Because your prayer, gene your genealogy goes back to this moment. Now, there might be some Jewish believers here. My guess is most of us are Gentile. Do you realize that your genealogy, if this doesn't happen, you're not here? I'm not saying that God couldn't have found another way or someone else, okay? All I'm saying is that your genealogy traces back to this moment. Call me a simpleton, but give me two people praying. We can change the world. More accurately, God can change the world through us. You know what? 
For 40 days, we've been hitting our knees, circling 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Never in my life have I seen the hand of God move the way that he's moved in recent days. You know what? I'm going to press in. I'm going to hit my knees. I, I'm, I'm done being satisfied with the things I can accomplish or the things I can do. I want to see God move powerfully in our generation. I want to see revival. I want to see God move in a way that people repent, that people are healed and delivered, that, that God's glory and power are revealed in a new way that the scales come off our eyes and we see Jesus Christ lifted up and glorified. Now listen, I would love for it to happen in our nation's capital. And the Lord knows my heart. I said to God, we're going we're gonna to pray for revival, not an ASAP as soon as possible, ALAT as long as it takes. We're going to get in a circle, we're going to hit our knees, and we're going to pray that God sends revival. And I've told the Lord, it does not need to start with us. Far be it from me to be as presumptuous as that. But the Lord knows my heart. God, I want in on it. I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of what you're doing. And uh, I want to thank you. What a joy and privilege to have a few minutes. Are you ready to pray? <laughs> Let's praise the Lord. God bless you guys. You know what? I, I write books so that uh, I can hang out with people. So that when I leave, you can take a part of me. And you know what? You'll, uh, I'll hang out with you for four or five hours. And if you're a slow reader, we'll hang out longer than that. Um, and so I hope, uh, I hope that gift is a blessing to you and that it gets you on your knees. Let's seek the Lord. God bless. Thank you so much. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's pray. All right, we're going to pray as we uh, commit ourselves to the Lord. Father, we come before you right now, and we kneel at the foot of your throne. God, we declare your sovereignty. We declare your faithfulness. We declare your power. We declare your goodness. God, you are God, and you are good. And Lord, we thank you that no good thing will God withhold from those who walk up rightly before him. We thank you that surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. We thank you that he who began a good work will carry it to completion. We thank you that you are able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to your power that's at work within us. May your kingdom come, and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. 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 amen.